The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm. Today's guest is Jennifer Otani. She's the pest management biologist and coordinator for the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network. She's at the Beaver Lodge Research Farm for AAFC. Jennifer, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Sean. How are you? I'm doing great. I am really looking forward to this Pest and Predator podcast. We're really going to focus on entomologists across the country, but one of the really cool things is is we're going to talk a lot about beneficials. Now, a lot of growers hear about beneficial insects all the time. From your standpoint, define them for us. What is a beneficial insect? Well, when we talk about beneficial insects. Uh, there are actually some other arthropods, but let's just keep it to insects. There is a huge number of species. These can be pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. All of these various organisms, which are insects, they have some very complex life, um, life cycles and interactions with some of our most important economic pests. And I think one of the great things that you're going to be doing with this podcast series is hopefully taking some in-depth um, examination of these various species and just how important they are, but also just how pervasive they are. And I think one of the cool things about all of these beneficials, we're hoping that growers and agrologists really start to maybe also understand that they're part of a really important system that basically helps regulate some of our most important pest populations. So were they misunderstood or forgotten about for a period of time? What happened here? So that's a really good question. You know, as entomologists, we spend a lot of our time researching insect pests and looking at some of these interactions which involve these beneficials. I wouldn't say that they've been forgotten, but it's maybe an area of research that a lot of producers maybe don't have as much appreciation for simply because it's actually really tough data to collect. So a number of people have been working on this globally for a very long time. In fact, originally before there were pesticides that were used in control, uh, some of our most important insect control was from biological control. Uh, I would say now we're starting to understand better some of these interactions and how some of these beneficials interact with our insect pests and really starting to understand maybe uh, with a very different perspective how we need to augment and preserve in order to maybe make the most of what is essentially free labor out in some of these fields. So it's, it's not a situation that anyone's really forgotten about them. It's more that as agriculture continues to evolve, some of our control methods we start to see kind of come in vogue and then maybe build more tools. We're starting to better understand how these beneficials are actually functioning, particularly in field crops. Yeah, I think for a while we we sort of thought of insects as like we do weeds, right? And so we when we have a crop and we have weeds in the field, we see those weeds as removing yield uh, from our crop. And so we try to eliminate all of those weeds. And, and I think we kind of looked at insects sort of the same way for a period of time. But now we've really, you know, through a lot of research that uh, people in Ag Canada and some of the provincial uh, stations, a lot of this work that's being done, we're, we're really getting to the point of realizing that we've got a whole bunch of insects that, as we label them beneficials, that are really, like you said, free labor. They're working for us inside that canopy, preserving and actually enhancing yield in some cases. So it's it, interesting that you actually have that comparison because I think what people need to understand is that when we're dealing with insect pests, it's not as if people aren't doing any research, but some of the most and highest priority research that would have been done first with regard to insect pests and field crops would be how to manage outbreaking populations. But one of the things that people need to understand is now that as we develop more data, as we have better research tools to kind of tease apart how, you know, what makes an insect pest outbreak, we start to see that there are other factors, other relationships that are starting to contribute or maybe even regulate some of these pest populations. 
So it's a question of having more data, more information, and being able to understand some of these relationships, especially in regard to some of our field crops that are grown across the prairie. Okay, spray decisions. Because if we're going to, you know, we just talked about weeds, you know, we go through and make a pass and we kill all the weeds. We do not want to do that with beneficials. We want to preserve them and keep them inside that crop canopy. So how does all of this impact our spray decisions? So really good question because I think most growers absolutely want to know how do you control situations. With weeds, we have populations that aren't really going to jump up, fly around, run around in the same way, uh, especially over a growing season in that short timeline. With our insects though, Here's where some of the things that growers are already doing start to fit into preserving beneficials. We really want people to scout because one of the most important things that you're trying to decide whether or not to spray is actually please be using an economic threshold. Uh, These insect pest populations, growers need to really remember. uh, You need to look at those populations and see, are you going to first of all have pest populations that need control? If you do, then we also understand that sometimes you're going to have to take the next step. The real area is when you don't have populations that exceed an economic threshold. We know from that data that those pest populations are not going to cause economic levels of damage, but they're also really important populations then, not just pests, but all of those other species that we really want to try and preserve and augment. And again, The reason that we really want to not spray if we don't have beyond the economic threshold is because of all of these other beneficial organisms that can be in the field that, unfortunately, because of which products we're using for our chemical uh, foliar applications of insecticides, growers need to remember that all of these insect species will be negatively affected. And when I say negatively, they're going to be killed. One of the really important things with many of these beneficial organisms, too, is that they don't have, um, they have longer life cycles. Let's put it this way. So, for example, for some of our ground beetles, they have multiple years where they're alive, you know, from egg to adult stage. So, when a grower decides to spray an insecticide to manage an economic pest, if they don't have that pest population beyond the economic threshold, they're actually jeopardizing some of those beneficial organisms that are helping regulate small pet populations. And really, it comes down to pollinators, too. I think the main thing is that we're really trying to help growers understand that every one of their spray outings does have an impact. And it's not just regulating pests. It's also going to be killing some of these beneficial organisms, which, frankly, takes some time to rebound. Now, is this is, is the beneficials a is it a canola thing or do we are there beneficials in all crops across the prairies? So, really good question. What we see with almost every insect species is that they're often regulating parasitoids, predators, maybe diseases that actually attack every species almost. So it's not just a canola. It's not just a wheat issue. It's actually the diversity is across all crops. Some crops do attract certain species of insects more so than others. And so there are some differences. But really, when we talk about beneficials, they're pervasive. And even more importantly, uh, we're really working hard to help people understand what is in their field crops, but also understanding that there can be a number of beneficial species that are in their field margins or in adjacent areas that actually then move into field crops and then have some regulatory or beneficial effects, particularly when we talk about pollinators. So it's not just one field, one crop. It's really the entire agro ecosystem that houses not just pests, but a number of these really important beneficial organisms. And really, that's a lot of work to do. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of species potentially, and that's why it's difficult data to collect. So what, what's the benefit to the grower? Is this, does everything come down to yield? There has to be some other things. Well, and I guess this is also a really good question. And this is where growers need to um, 
we need to really consider, okay, what are the benefits? Uh, we know that with some situations, growers have some very tight margins. We know that they're not willing to carry a lot of risk. And I think a lot of growers sometimes look at insect pests as risk. Um, one of the issues, though, is that with these beneficial organisms and our insect pests, what we see is that in a lot of fields, we don't always have outbreaks and situations. So, in fact, you know, from year to year, these things will change. Sometimes we do have big outbreaks. But by and large, if a grower stands back and looks over a longer time period of several years, it's not every field that has these huge outbreak populations. And so there is some benefit to not just spraying every single field. I think we understand that that's not sustainable. But really, there's going to be some benefit because we want these organisms to be in there. Um, the other thing is... You know, growers often are busy worried about one insect pest. And what I'm often trying to communicate to them is, okay, maybe you're worried about birth and armyworms, but understand that some of these beneficials, particularly with general predators and general parasitoids, which actually will attack a number of different species of other insects, they actually are helping regulate some of your population. You don't even know they're doing it. But there is a benefit to having that because that's actually part of an insurance system in that you always have something that hopefully will respond to some level of an insect pest and hopefully regulate over time. So it is a bit of an abstract concept for growers to understand because I feel like growers usually want to have a, something very tangible. It's going to save me this many dollars. But over the long term, what we're really trying to advise, too, is that you need to retain some of these populations because they may be regulating over a much longer term and maintaining these smaller populations. Outbreaks can occur with different species every once in a while, but certainly we want to maintain some level, level of these beneficials because without them, I think then the potential for outbreaks every year starts to become maybe more of a reality for growers. That can actually have much bigger costs. I think most growers also really are not super anxious to apply a lot of insecticide in most cases. And I think in that way, it's a really good thing. In some ways, letting some of these natural systems set up, you know, try and control some of these insect pest populations, that's actually really going on all the time. Okay, so in order to know what is in your canopy, you need to use a sweep net. So... What are some of the key things that growers have to remember when they're using that sweep net? Okay. So some of our provincial entomologists have some super videos demonstrating how to correctly sweep in the various canopies. Um, we also, with the Prairie Pest Monitoring Network, recently with help with the from the Western Grains Research Foundation project that we have, there's a new video on describing how to sweep, uh, what the contents of a sweep net are going to look like, because let's face it, not everyone gets a chance to empty a sweep net and look. Um, the key things with the sweep net is really making sure that you're sampling in a more than one place in a field. Uh, if there are protocols and economic thresholds for some of our insect pests, try to follow the sampling methods that they advise. Quite often, if you follow the protocols, it allows you to get a more accurate assessment of what's happening in the whole field rather than just one little corner. Because we do know with some insect pests, they can aggregate, but at the same time, it's best to have a better sense of what's happening over the whole field. Sweet nets, you can buy very expensive ones. You can buy cheap ones. The main thing is that you have to actually swing it in the canopy. And a lot of people laugh when I say that, but it's really true. You need to sample at a few different places in the field. So, for example, when we're doing some of our surveying for ligus, we're doing 10 sweeps in a field, but we're actually doing it at at least five different places of the field so that we get some sense of the variation, but more importantly, what's going on over the whole field. Uh, in terms of actually sweeping for certain insect pests, oh, I forgot what I was going to say, Sean. <laughs> In terms of sweeping for certain insect pests. Right. Okay. So the sweet net is definitely one of the most effective tools because it's cheap, relatively easy to swing. Uh, one of the things that we often get asked is, 
you know, does it matter if you're tall or short? In many ways, it can to a certain degree, but more importantly, it's more a question of getting samples from different places in the field. And if you can, have the same person doing the sampling. I think one of the things you also need to remember is not all of our economic pests can accurately be assessed with a sweet net. Sweet nets can be used to detect, but for example, with diamondback moths, uh, we often use a sweet net to see are they in the canopy, especially the larvae, but then if you find them, then you turn to the actual monitoring protocol, which actually involves you doing plant assessment pulling plants and tapping them out for the diamondback larvae to assess numbers. So yes, a sweet net tool, sweet net is a very important tool. It tells us yes, no. For some of our insect pests, particularly in canola, it is used to compare against economic thresholds. But just remember that there are some insect pests that there are some very specific other ways to sample. I will be very honest, we use our sweet net to tell us yes, no, and then start looking a lot more carefully. And so it is a really important tool. Jennifer, this has been awesome. Thanks very much for joining us on the Pest and Predator podcast. Great. The Pest and Predator podcast is brought to you by Field Heroes, powered by the Western Grains Research Foundation. Visit fieldheroes.ca to learn how beneficial insects can benefit your farm.